about? So, with the with the manipulation stuff, uh, I looked up Stockholm syndrome this morning, and a lot of what it said about Stockholm syndrome. Uh, oh, a lot of what I said. Oh, no, a lot of the things that I have done with Jimmy fit the bill for me being a perpetrator of Stockholm. And the I mean, story was literally the opposite of what people were painting it to be. That's the perfect way to keep you distracted. Make the ninety-pound girl the victim. Nope. <laughs> I know I'm a big dude, but I had much bigger dudes holding me down while he punched me in the gut. <laughs> Took about 100 punches to get me, but... And I, why am I still here with her? A little bit of Stockholm, a little bit of love. And I'm the one that gets to laugh at that. Guys, I know what I'm doing. I know how to work my way through this. The first one being there's a perceived threat to your life where the victim feels like the abuser or the captor could in fact kill them and this might be a physiological a physical threat they feel that they're actually going to die they're going to kill their body it might be a psychological threat they might just fear that they're going to die it might be a sense of like soul death where they're destroying your soul or a sense of identity theft where they are destroying your entire also sense of self terrified of going to jail for what she did to me she doesn't have to because I, ironically, I have to say whether or not she does. Second criteria of Stockholm Syndrome is an act of kindness. When the captor or abuser extends a small offer of kindness to the person being held hostage, to the victim in the relationship, that perceived kindness then tricks the brain, confuses the brain. Massage day. I like massage and so, oh, that's a cue. And then, and then no, no, no. Oh, my way. Uh, <laughs> and, and so what I found, though, is I found this gif, and it was of squirrels. And there was a squirrel giving another squirrel massage. And it was adorable. I was like, you should have done it. Oh, no. So, yeah. <laughs> and there is a, yeah. I really like gifts. <laughs> Like, there's some really good one out there. There's some really good ones out there. <sighs> the third criteria of Stockholm Syndrome is the isolation, where the captor or the abuser has isolated the victim or the hostage from the perceptions of other people. And this is a classic abuse maneuver where the abuser will always isolate the victim. They will triangulate people in your life away from you. They will make you jealous or paranoid or afraid of people in your life, people who actually care for you. They will physically isolate you. They might move you to a new place in some way, like get rid of your cell phone, somehow isolate you from Most connecting with people. Have some bad habits. <laughs> Yours are only worse because that's what you were introduced to. That's what that's what you were you were being rewarded for those habits. Yeah. You're no longer. Yeah. So get this. The fourth criteria for Stockholm Syndrome is the perceived inability to escape, where the victim, the hostage, feels like there's no escape, there's no way out. This is where the learned helplessness comes in. The victim feels like it's hopeless, like they can never get out. You know, maybe they got roped in financially to this person, the abuser didn't want them to get a job or told them to quit their job or sabotaged their reputation at work and they lost their job or just maybe they're self-employed they're an entrepreneur, they have their own business, and they just feel so crappy because of all this abuse that they can't put that energy into their business. The business is failing. They don't have the financial resources to get out. It We're could under the be belief and the bias that they thing. could actually take me down and like destroy my life and kill me without anyone noticing. And that is a temptation that no one, including Kate, could deny. You want to own that, Kate? Yeah. Kate literally tried to kill me. Mm. Like in real life. Attempted murder. Um... Kate literally tried to kill me. Like in real life. Attempted murder. Um, also terrified of going to jail for what she did to me. She doesn't have to. Because I, ironically, I have to say whether or not she does. 
so she could be the center of my world. And she's not, and she never will be. Very foundation. One is safety. You have to feel safe, not just in your physical environment, but also in your emotional environment. And that means, are you able to be truthful with yourself? Are you able to be around people that you trust, that love you, that have your back? Do you have your back? Do you feel safe with yourself? The second one is truth. Truth is what set you free. Truth is what helps you realize what happened and make sense of what happened, understand what happened. And sharing that truth with other people is paramount to the healing journey. That's why you need to have a support network, people who get it, people who understand, people who validate you. Not like the societal temptation and pattern, which is to blame the victim for what happened. You know, And if you're hanging out with people who won't allow you to speak your truth, if you're hanging out with people People who don't believe your truth, you're setting yourself back from healing. You need to get away from those people. You need to be around positive people, uplifting people, unconditionally loving people who support you in your truth and help you heal and get better. The only other possibility is to fall back into the denial. And that's very dangerous because the denial isn't healing. The denial is repression. It's resistance, and it's only going to get worse the longer you stay in denial. And that's the temptation really here is the cognitive dissonance because it's like on one hand, this person is incredibly abusive and does these horrible things. And when you look at the bigger patterns, you just see like this person is an abusive person. And then on the other hand, what you see is that there's like these intermittent acts of kindness. Like this person does these things that seems like they care about you. It appears that they care about you and it confuses your mind when you're trying to hold on to both of these things well it's this and it's this they're abusive and they're kind but it's all a big picture and that's the thing because that cognitive dissonance will keep you stuck that cognitive dissonance will encourage you to go back into the denial the cognitive dissonance is what like short circuits the brain like it fries the brain where you're going back and forth and back and forth and you're like and then you're right back in the denial You've slid right back into the denial. You've gone through the abuse amnesia where you've forgotten the abusive parts. And now you're just, you know, rationalizing how this is a good person and they're really trying to get better and they're really sorry and they're really making efforts. And that's a very, very dangerous place to be. So I just wanted to put this out there to let you know what to look out for with the Stockholm Syndrome, with the trauma bonding, how to recognize this within yourself. Like, cause- That's all, folks.